My colleagues and I uh, want to wel all of, welcome all of you to Caltech's Chan Seminar for Social and Decision Neuroscience. The goal of this seminar is to provide a forum for showcasing outstanding work in the field, as well as a space for discussing the work in detail. To facilitate these goals, we have um, organized the event along the following rules. First, the, the speaker is gonna give a presentation for the first 45 minutes and no questions will be allowed during this time. Second, the presentation is gonna be followed by a fire chat that will be moderated. Third, we have to uh, turn off everyone's audio. Fourth, the public chat feature is allowed though, and we encourage everyone to use it uh, at any time during the event. And I want to uh, let everyone know that the event is being recorded and will be posted in Caltech's YouTube channel. So with those preliminaries out of the way, it is my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker in this lecture series, Professor Ernst Fer from the University of Zurich. Now, Ernst has made pioneering contributions to behavioral economics and is considered one of the founders of, the, of neuroeconomics. His work in social preferences and reciprocity has been critical in inspiring many of us to work in this field, and I include myself in that list. Now, consistent with his work, one could say to provide evidence with his work, he has also been a leader in providing public goods in the field and has set up a very high standard for the rest of us. Today, he will share with us exciting new work about the attentional foundations of the classic framing effect. Welcome, Ernst. So now I'm gonna stop sharing so you can take over. Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to speak on the topic of attentional foundations of framing effects. So this work is joined with Gaia Lombardi and Todd Hare, who are both also at the University of Zurich. Uh, to motivate my, uh, this research, let me remind you of Kahneman and Tversky's famous framing papers, famous fr framing results. Uh, published in the Econometrica paper 1979 and in the Science paper 1981. Together, these two papers have almost 70,000 Google Scholar sites. And it's probably fair to say that these two papers or the, the work uh, displayed in these papers is among the most influential in all of the social sciences. Now, interestingly, framing and presenta presentation effects have actually been documented even earlier. For example, there is a a paper by Selton and Berg in a duopoly experiment, or there is a paper by Pruitt in 1970 on the so-called decomposed prisoner's dilemma, which also shows framing effects. Now, the question that is raised by the existence of framing effects, why should mere changes in the description of an objectively identical relationship between choices and outcomes affect decision-making? And I think it's probably, uh, correct to say that framing effects are among the most fundamental violations of rational choice in, because they violate the principle of invariance. Now, many of you, probably all of you have seen this famous graph. It basically relates to the framing effect uh, by Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, and the framing effect relates to, the, to the, the fact that in the domain of gains, people tend to be uh, risk averse, whereas in the domain of losses, uh, they tend to be less risk averse or even risk seeking. And Kahneman and Tversky explain this in terms of changes in the valuation of options, basically. Yeah. So, and when you read their 1981 paper, then they use the metaphor that different frames give rise to different perspectives on a problem, or that different frames change the perception of the problem. So they use this metaphor of changing percep perception or changing uh, perspective. And they, they relate it to, uh, to the changing perspective on a visual scene. So when you watch mountains from different perspectives, their, their height looks sometimes different. However, uh, beyond, these two be beyond these metaphors, they don't provide further explorations into the mechanisms underlying the framing effect. So we have still 
quite quant limited understanding of why framing effects refer, occur, what the underlying mechanisms are. Now, uh, what, uh, what could be the mechanisms behind the framing effect? Uh, well, if nothing changes but the description of the situation, it seems natural, in my view at least, to hypothesize that different frames focus attention on different aspects of the decision problem. And it may be this change in attention that may cause changes in choice behavior. And here I cite a few papers that actually show that changes in attention, changes in visual fixations uh, may have a causal effect on behavior. Uh, and uh, actually a, a research program that puts attention into the focus of uh, examining the impact uh, of framing on, on choices is very similar to an overall research agenda that considers imperfect perception, imperfect attention and memory as some of the potentially unifying and deeper forces uh, behind uh, behavioral anomalies. So let me go straight to our experiment and to the guiding theory. So we tried in this paper or in this uh, research to explain the framing effect in the domain of risk taking. Therefore, subjects face a series of binary choices between a sure option and a risky option. In some choice, in some situations, the, the, the sure option is framed as a gain, in others, it's framed as a loss. We also record subjects' eye movements with an eye tracker and use their visual fixations as a proxy for their attention. So we look at the, the duration of eye gaze towards an option is taken as a proxy for the attention allocated to that option. And based on behavioral and eye tracking data, we estimate the structural parameters of an attention-based drift diffusion model. In addition, we conducted an experiment to check the causal impact of attention manipulation on choices. Now let me come to the questions we can address within this framework. First of all, and perhaps the most fundamental question is, does framing indeed affect the allocation of attention to the different options? Next, are the changes in the allocation of attention associated with changes in choice behavior that can, that can explain the framing effect in risky choices? Third, can the attention-based drift diffusion model uh, account for the framing effect in risky choices. In other words, does the model capture major behavioral regularities such that we can have confidence in the model? And finally, uh, we ask what are the theoretical and empirical mechanisms that account for the framing effect? Uh, does framing change subjects valuation of prospects as hypothesized in Kahneman and Tversky? Does framing change the discounting of unattended options, which is a potential hypothesis in the, within the realm of uh, the attention-based drift diffusion model? Does it change the drift rate? So we all don't know, but these are the questions we address in this research. Now let me come straight to the main experiment, which is very similar to the experiment by De Martino et al. published in 2008 in Science. So in the gain condition, subjects first see a screen, such as you receive 60 Swiss francs, and then they can decide to keep the 60 Swiss francs with an 80% probability. So these 60 Swiss francs, they are provisionally allocated to the subjects, or they can keep 48 Swiss francs uh, with 100% probability. This is the gain condition. In the last condition, we display, we describe the same situation, but now the, the sure option where they have 100% probability of getting 48 is described as 100% probability of losing 12 of the 60. Now in the experiment, the subjects don't see the keep 60 and the keep 48. Uh, I just, we just wrote it down here uh, uh, for the presentation such that it's easy for you to grasp. So what subjects learned before the experiment is what the different colors mean. For example, blue in this case means you are in the keep frame. So in the gain frame, orange means you are in the lose frame or in the loss frame. Uh, and uh, if, if the rectangle is full, it means you keep the full amount. If the rectangle is not full, you keep only part of the amount and so on. 
So therefore, we had a training session before the main experiment in which subject's task was to estimate the probability and the amount that was displayed in the graphical description of the options. So when it, so for example, they had what we call probability learning is a screen like this. They had, they see this screen, they have to tell us whether the color indicates the keep or the loose frame. And they have to tell us whether this probability by what the probability is, which probability is implied by this probability pi. For example, you have 100% pi here. It's divided up in five equal sized portions and two of the portions are in orange and that means 40% 40 uh, 40 probability. Uh, for example, when it comes to the amount training, uh, the subjects saw these two screens sequentially. So for example, they saw that they received 70 Swiss francs. Now they had to understand that this was divided up by five and multiplied by three, which is 42. So they have again to indicate the amount that is indicated by the blue uh, area in this rectangle. And uh, uh, they have to indicate whether this is a keep or a loose frame. Of course, colors and so on, they were all counterbalanced. And actually subjects were, were very quick in learning this. So after five minutes, the, the failure rate, the, the mistakes they made, they were just uh, minimal. So we are very confident that the subjects very quickly understand uh, uh, when they see the when they see the presentation of the options, they quickly understand what they imply. Now, let me come to the attention-based drift diffusion model, which is the guiding model for our research here. And you will see later on why this is the guiding model. Well, in, 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 I mean, it is the the model basically assumes that at, attentional shifts cause changes in behavior in behavior. So it's a natural candidate in this regard. So here is. Uh, the basic intuition of the model that probably most of you already know, you have a relative decision value, you have boundaries that have to be crossed for this relative decision variable value. So if, if the relative decision value crosses the barrier on for the left, then the left option is chosen. If it crosses the barrier to the for the right, then the right option is chosen. And the important thing is that the tension modulates the drift rate here. For example, if the subjects look towards the left, there is an additional push here towards the left barrier. If it looks towards the right, then there is an additional uh, push in, in the movement of the relative decision variable in the right direction and so on. Okay, now here is the formal structure of the model. We have the, the, this differential equation which describes the change in the relative decision variable as a function of the overall drift rate mu of t and some noise parameter sigma. Uh, and then the overall drift rate, and that's the critical part here, the overall drift rate is given by this equation. And so for example, if the sure option is attended, then the, drift, the overall drift rate is given by the drift parameter delta multiplied with this expression in parentheses which is given by the utility of the sure option minus an attentional discount for the gamble for the unattended gamble multiplied with the utility or the expected utility of the gamble. So basically you see that the sure option, if the sure option is attended because theta g, the, the, the discount parameter for the gamble is typically smaller than one, there is an attentional discount. So the gamble gets less weight in the, uh, in the evidence accumulation process. And vice versa, if the gamble is attended, then the sure option gets less weight by being multiplied with an attentional discount factor theta s. Note we have different discount factors for the two options. And um, there is a reason we, we, we tried also identical discount factors. It just turns out to be the case. It's impossible to explain the data to reproduce the data with identical discount factors. So the evidence strongly su suggests different discount factors for the two options. Then we have the two boundaries, which are equal on both sides. And then this is th the utility function that we assume. So utility of the sure option is just the amount that the subjects get in the, when, it, when it chooses the sure option to the power of alpha. 
and the expected utility of the gamble is just the probability with which the gamble amount is received times the resulting utility. Now, uh, within this modeling context, uh, we can uh, basically allow basically for different discount factors, different drift parameters and thresholds and risk aversion parameters across frames. So basically, when we estimate the model from the data, we, we can check whether the framing effect affects these parameters of the drift diffusion model. And for example, it could be that uh, the, the typical parameters that are hypothesized to play a role in the, in the drift diffusion model, like these discount factors, they have zero explanatory power for the framing effect because they don't change across frames. So whereas the, 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 util, the, the traditional account of the framing effect is the Kahneman and Tversky account, which would say that, well, the alpha changes across the frames. So basically within this model, we can have a horse race between the traditional forces like relative valuations change uh, when, when, framing, when framing changes, uh, as opposed to, uh, let's say, it, uh, uh, attentional discount factors change or drift rate parameters change and so on. So we also estimate then the model parameters, all these model parameters with a hierarchical Bayesian estimation method. Okay, now what are the potential underlying mechanisms uh, uh, behind the framing effects? Well, here are a few candidates, for example. The gain frame, uh, if the gain frame in, in, induces more allocation of attention to the sure option, which is, could be true or wrong, but if that is the case, then if more allocation is, 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 is directed towards the sure option, then the gamble is more often discounted because it's unattended. And this should increase the choice frequency of the sure option. And this should generate risk averse behavior. Okay. And the mechanism would be uh, an ADDM mechanism. Uh, another uh, effect of uh, uh, changing the frames could be that the discounting of the non attended option changes these discount parameter changes. So the discount parameters change. And here again, if the gain frame increases attentional discounting of the gamble, for example, that would be the theta g. Okay. And notice an increase in attentional discounting of the gamble means theta g becomes lower. Theta, so the gamble becomes less, gets less weight in the evidence accumulation process. Okay. If that is the case, if theta g becomes lower, then a given attention advantage of the sure option would be associated with a stronger choice advantage uh, for the sure option in that frame. Uh, in addition, framing could just change the risk aversion parameter alpha. That's the traditional route that has been hypothesized by prospect theory. So if the gain frame increases risk aversion, or which is a tantamount to decreasing alpha, then the sure option is more frequently chosen in that frame. So these are some of the potential mechanisms that could be at work here. Uh, or uh, finally, a fourth possibility is that the drift rate parameter changes. And for example, if, if this expression in the brackets here, which is the relevant expression if the sure option is attended, okay, which is the overall, if you multiply this with the drift with this delta, then this gives you the overall drift rate in case the sure option is attended. If, if this term in the brackets is bigger in the gain frame, because theta g is, for example, smaller in that frame, okay, then an increase in delta magnifies the choice advantage of the sure option in that frame. So there are various potential routes through which uh, uh, framing could play a role here. Now, let me come to the data. Uh, so the first and the most, perhaps most important question is, does the gain frame cause more risk averse choices? Well, this has been replicated, I guess, thousands of times. And so what we see here, uh, it's also the case here. So what we see here is uh, the probability of choosing the sure option as a function of stake size. So the stake size, by the way, I should add that here at this point, the stake size is just the monetary value of the sure option in a given decision problem. 
because in this experiment, the monetary value of the sure option was always matched with the expected value of the gamble. And therefore, uh, if the monetary value of the sure option then the, rises, then also the expected value of the gamble is higher. And that indicate that basically is tantamount to an increase in stake size, okay? And what you see here is uh, two things in this, in this graph. First, in the gain condition, the probability of choosing the sure option, so the probability of risk averse choices is always higher than in the loss frame. And uh, in both frames, uh, increasing stake size leads to increasing risk aversion. Now, we also can look at this at the individual level. So basically 90 to 95% of the subjects display these behavioral framing effects and only a minority has the opposite uh, framing effect. And so, so basically we are on a safe ground here. The basic precondition, the basic fact that we want to explain is here, okay? Now, uh, the next important question is, does framing affect the allocation of attention? Well, what you see here in this graph, yes, that's indeed the case. So what you see here is the average percent of fixations that go towards the sure option, okay? And what you see here is in the gain condition, the sure option is significantly more often attended than in the loss condition, okay? And you see also, so this is basically written down here on the right-hand side of the screen. And this is consistent with a framing effect on choices, okay? This is exactly what the ADDM would predict. If there's more attention in the gain frame going to the sure option, then we should observe a higher choice frequency of the sure option. However, there is an additional prediction that comes from that model. If there is uh, more attention going to the sure option and recall the, 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 the graphs, the sequence of graphs I have shown you when I tried to explain the, the intuition behind the attention-based drift diffusion model, if more attention is going to an option, then that gives an additional push towards the boundary for that option because the other option gets attentionally discounted, okay? And that means we, we get quicker decision-making. We, we, so, so, we should observe that response times decline. So basically um, this data pattern here implies according to the ADDM that response times uh, are smaller in the gain condition than in the loss condition. And what we also see here is that more attention to the sure option is allocated if stakes increase. That has also a prediction. Actually, that means that increasing risk aversion as a function of stake size uh, uh, it, it could also be an attentional effect, okay? And we have an additional prediction here that comes from the attention-based drift diffusion model because if more attention is allocated to the sure option at higher stakes, then the decisions at higher stakes should be quicker than decisions at lower stakes. And so we can ask whether these two predictions are met by the data. Well, here you see the graph, they're beautifully met by the data. So what you see in this graph is here the logarithm of response times in milliseconds as a function of stake size. And you see that in the gain condition, response times are generally smaller, sorry, response times are generally smaller than in the loss condition and response times decline with stake size exactly as predicted by the model. Okay, so there, there are other predictions here. Uh, according to the ADDM, the link between attention and choice probability should hold also at the level of the individual trial. So when I show you that in the gain condition, there is on average uh, more attention going to the sure option, and even in the loss condition, there is more attention going to the sure option, and these are averages. But there are always individual trials where this is not the case. And according to the model in these individual trials, we should have kind of, uh, that should have a behavioral effect. So in particular in trials in which the gamble has an attentional advantage over the sure option, the choice advantage of the sure option should be lower. That's a prediction. 
And that's again neatly met by the data because what you see here is you see here on the vertical axis the probability of choosing the sure option as a function of j, you stake size again for the gain and for the loss condition. And when the gamble has a fixation time advantage, that's the brown or the orange lines, then you see that the choice advantage of the sure option is reduced. And that holds true for the gain condition and for the loss condition. Okay, finally, we may ask the question, well, is individuals frame induced change in attention related to individuals framing effect in choices? So do individuals who display a stronger framing effect on attention also display a stronger framing effect on choices? So if the attentional shift that is caused by framing is indeed the driver of the behavioral shift that is caused by framing, then we should see this positive correlation. And what you see on this graph, yes, indeed, that's also the case. So the, 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 the raw correlation is almost 80% here between the framing effect uh, in, in attention and the framing effect in behavior. And when you run a regression, then the R square is almost 60%. So, so it seems that individuals who display a, a stronger framing effect on, at the level of attention also display a stronger framing effect at the level of choice behaviors. Now, there are two further non-trivial predictions that follow from, from the model. Uh, and they are related to the question how fixation time advantages transform to choice advantages at different overall values of the option. Now, the, the prediction that comes from the model is that a given fixation time advantage, so you fix the fixation time advantage, that fixation time advantage is translated into a higher choice advantage at higher overall values of the options. So in terms of our notation, that means if I increase the monetary value of the sure option, let's call that MS, and if I increase the certainty equivalent of the gamble, so the, the certainty equivalent is just the subjective, mon subjectively expressed monetary valuation of the gamble. If I increase both such that their difference remains constant, so relative valuations don't change, it's only the stake size that changes, okay. I only increase the stake size, then increasing, increases that, that this increase in the stake size increases the choice advantage of the option with a given attention advantage. What is the intuition here? Well, the intuition is as follows. If you, if you raise the stakes, okay, and you keep attentional discount factors constant, and you keep also fixation time advantage constant, you nevertheless multiply the higher stake with a higher given attentional discount factor. And so the attentional discount is higher at higher stakes. And that's written down here, the attentional discount for the non-attended option. For example, if the non-attended option is the gamble, then this is the attentional discount for the gamble uh, becomes higher because CE is higher. And likewise, if stake size increases, then the, uh, the attentional discount for the sure option uh, in increases if the sure option is not attended. And that means that a given fixation time advantage generates a higher advantage at higher overall stakes. Now in our setup, we have seen that the sure option is typically advantaged attentionally. So because the sure option is typically advantaged attentionally, it benefits basically from this effect or in other words, if stake size increases, holding relative valuations constant, we should see higher choice frequency of the sure option. So that's a prediction that follows from the model. And the question is whether we will see it in the data. Now there's another non-trivial prediction that follows from the model. And that prediction is that, that we should see an interaction effect between stake size and visual attention. Okay, and for the following reason, a rise in the fixation time 
for the sure option implies that this option is more frequently attentionally advantaged, okay? We know that it's generally advantaged. And now if, if we have an additional rise in fixation time towards the sure option, then, then that means uh, it's, it's more frequently attentionally advantaged. Now we have also seen that at higher overall stakes, uh, the sure option is more frequently chosen, okay? And that means at higher overall values of both options, a higher frequency of an attentional advantage, which follows from an increase in fixation time towards the sure option, means that the higher discount on the non-attended option becomes more frequently relevant, okay? So the previous argument that I made is in the stake size, uh, when, I, when I discussed the stake size effect was that a higher stake size implies that the sure option is more frequently chosen, okay? This is a it increases the choice advantage of the sure option. And this, 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 this choice advantage becomes more frequently relevant if the sure option is more frequently attended. Thus, we should see that the coefficient in the regression that explains the probability of choosing the sure option, that the, the coefficient on the interaction effect of stake size with fixation towards the sure option should be positive. Now, let's see whether it is. So what I show you here is a series of regressions uh, that test this prediction. And you shouldn't carefully look now at the different models. Actually, we could basically just look at the full model here, look at the fourth model um, to, to save time. We, I show you this regression later on again. I look at it more carefully than the different, but look at the full model that controls for everything. And what you see here first that's what we already know is that if fixations towards the sure option uh, are higher, then the, the sure option is chosen more frequently. Okay, and you see here this positive coefficient. That's just confirming that this is a significant effect. We know that already from the graphs. Now, the interesting thing is the second box here, if you like, this measures the stake size effect because if the stake size increases, controlling for the relative valuation, then we should see a positive coefficient and regardless of which model we look at, it's always positive. So a higher stake size, at a higher stake size, the attentional discount for the non-attended option is higher and therefore controlling for attention and relative valuation, a higher MS should increase the probability of choosing S according to the model, which is what we observe. And third, this is uh, the effect down here. Uh, we should see a positive interaction effect between stake size and fixation towards the sure option, which is exactly what we observe. Okay, so all these, these, these non-trivial predictions are also met by the data. Now, let me come to a problem that uh, always comes up, uh, particularly in when you talk to economists, but not yeah. only when you talk to economists. I mean, the model assumes that attention causes choice in a sense. Now, but could it be that the valuation of the options affects attention? So could there be reverse causality? Uh, and in order to address this problem, we do several things. First of all, uh, we, uh, we elicited the certainty equivalence of, for the gamble, so the subjective monetary evaluation of the gamble uh, uh, in a separate experiment. So we have the elicited certainty equivalence that help us address this question. We can also compute the certainty equivalence from our structural model because we have an estimate of alpha, which gives us basically the certainty equivalence of the gamble. Uh, and this enables us to examine the correlations between the, the relative valuations and visual fixations. And the question we ask is, if relative valuations change, so if let's say the, the fixed, the sure option is considered more valuable relative to the risky option, does that direct more attention towards the sure option? So that's the question and vice versa. And then we can address this in the, in the following regression so what we have here is again, a fixed effects Bayesian regression. In column one, the dependent variable is the percentage of fixation that goes towards the sure option. In column two, 
it's the probability of an, a, a fixation time advantage for the sure option is the dependent variable. And uh, uh, what you see here, first of all, is this, is, this, this uh, variable here, the, the treatment dummy, just uh, confirms that there is a treatment effect on attention. So what we see is in the last condition, there is less attention going towards the sure option, regardless whether we measure it in percentage or as a, as a discrete variable. What we also see is the stake size effect on attention, okay, that I have shown you already previously in graphs. So here, this regression just tells you, yes, this is a significant effect. So at higher stakes, more attention is going towards the sure option. And this is our uh, variable of interest in this regression. For a given stake size, do changes in relative valuation affect attention? And what we see here is that these effects are basically zero uh, and there doesn't seem to be a, an impact of evaluation of relative valuation of attentions, of relative valuation of options on attention. So the regression suggests there is no reverse causality. Now a regression is a regression, uh, it's not always totally convincing. For this reason, we also ran an additional experiment in which we exogenously manipulated attention. I don't go into this experiment. We can do this in the discussion phase of the, of the seminar. Uh, I just want to save time here, but I can just tell you so much when we explicitly manipulate attention, then what we see is a causal effect of attention on choice. And that's exactly what the model basically, in our context, I mean, there are other papers that have shown in different contexts that there is a causal effect of attention on choice, but we wanted to be sure that also in our case here, when we study the framing effect, this is also true. And yes, it's true. Now, uh, to move, let me make a preliminary summary because many of the, there are so many results here. So the preliminary summary, uh, 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 is as follows. Framing and stake size have a direct impact on the allocation of visual fixations, or, which is a proxy for attention. The gain frame increases attention to the sure option. Higher stakes increase attention to the sure option. Now, the ADDM prediction one then, given these two facts, is that both attention effects should increase the choice frequency of the sure option, which is the case. ADDM prediction two is that both attention effects should reduce response times, which is the case. ADDM prediction three says individual level framing effects on choice are strongly correlated with individual level framing effects on attention, which is the case. The fourth prediction is that controlling for fixations, higher stake size in increases the choice frequency of the attentionally advantaged option, in our case, the sure option which is also the case. The fifth prediction is that there's a positive interaction effect between stake size and fixations towards the attentionally advantaged it as the sure option, also the case. And we observe no reverse causality from the relative valuation of options on attention and targeted changes in attention. I didn't show you that. I only claimed that we do show it target the changes in attention cause significant reductions in the, actually we targeted, by targeted I mean, we directed the tension in such a way that we should see a smaller framing effect. And that's indeed what we see in this attention manipulation experiment. So we can diminish the framing effect by basically one half. Now, let me come to the structural estimation of ADDM parameters. Basically what this slide tells you is that the, the ADDM does fairly well. So let's have this, this, this reason to, to have confidence in the model. And so it's, it makes sense to, to, to estimate it structurally. Okay. Now, what is the advantage of a structural estimation of the ADDM? Well, there are two advantages. One is we get more insights into the mechanisms we know whether the mechanisms run through changes in, in the attentional discount factors or through changes in the risk aversion parameters or through changes in the drift rate. Uh, and uh, in, in addition, we get uh, quantities, we get, we get numbers basically 
from the structural estimation. And we can use these numbers uh, to, uh, to, to, to understand the framing effect better. In particular, a structural estimation lets you answer the question whether Kahneman and Tversky, I mean, it could be theoretically the case that all this ADDM stuff that comes in addition here is irrelevant. And the only thing that matters is the risk aversion parameter. So the model could be that that could be an outcome of the, of the data. And so we basically, we can have kind of a horse race between the traditional explanation and, and this new attention focused explanation. Okay, so then let me ask the question, the following question. Um, does framing change the attentional discount parameter for the gamble? Well, I show you here, uh, interestingly, my, uh, here it goes. So what you see here, so we use a hierarchical Bayesian model recall, and that means we, we have, we estimate a whole distribution of, uh, parameters, for example, in this case of the attentional discount for the gamble. And what you see here is that, yes, in the gain condition, the attentional discount for the gamble is much higher because theta g is much lower, okay? And this is particularly true for those subjects who show an above um, median framing effect, uh, in median behavioral framing effect, basically. Uh, and that means that a given, what does that imply in terms of behavior? Well, it implies that a given fixation time advantage for the sure option causes more choice advantage in the gain condition. So we basically identify here the attentional discount on the gamble as one, uh, as, a, as a primary potential candidate uh, for explaining the framing effect on choices. Now, to what extent does framing change the attention discount per, uh, parameter for the sure option? Well, here the effect is much more muted. It's also, it goes in the same direction, but it's much more muted. And um, what does that mean? Well, we also see here that in the last condition, the sure option is less discounted when attended, okay. Uh, because we're talking now about the attentional discount for the sure option, not for the gamble. Notice, and so in the last condition, the sure option is less discounted when, unattend when unattended. And the uh, behavioral implication is basically, if there is a shift of attention towards the gamble in the last condition, which is partly true, you know, we have seen that in the last condition that the, the attention advantage of the sure option decreases. So there's a shift in attention towards the gamble in the loss condition. And that shift in attention towards the gamble has less of an effect on choice compared to when the, 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 the attention discount factor for the sure option would be the same as in the gain condition. So it kind of mutes the framing effect, if you like. It, 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 it mutes the framing effect. Uh, it, it works against the framing effect a little bit here. Now, the next question is, do we see changes in the drift parameter across frames? And the short answer is no. It's basically very similar uh, in both in the gain and in the loss condition, except that in the gain condition, it's always less noisy. Uh, and do we uh, observe a change in the risk aversion parameter? And the answer is yes, we do. And you see it most vividly here for the above median framing effect subjects, you see that in the gain condition, the alpha, you know what we, dis what we display here is the risk aversion parameter alpha. And in the gain condition, this risk aversion parameter is significantly smaller for above median, effect, uh, median framing effect subjects, um, implying that they are much more uh, risk averse and go much more towards the sure option. So the traditional forces hypothesized by Kahneman and Tversky are still there here, but there are other uh, forces there. And uh, finally, what I can show you now based on the, based on our structural estimates and our other considerations, I can show you an overall regression here. And this is the same regression that I have shown you before, but now it's totally complete because I show you the last four variables on the bottom also. 
here, which forces me to 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 put the whole uh, table on the right side of the of the screen. And let's go slowly through this uh, table. Then I'm almost finished. So first of all, column one. What does column one do? Well, the dependent variable is here the probability of choosing the sure option. Okay, and it's a fixed effects Bayesian logistic regression. And in column one, we only have the treatment dummy and the stake size. You have a constant, we have the loss condition, the treatment dummy, we have stake size, and we have their interaction, okay? And in column two, we add only relative valuation information, which is uh, the value of the sure option minus the certainty equivalent of the gamble, okay? So we add the value, or the relative valuations, you could call this the traditional variables and their interaction with the treatment condition, okay? And what you see is that our marginal or conditional R squares increase quite a bit when we add these relative valuation uh, variables. Now in column three, we add only fixation data. So we don't add relative valuation variables. If you like, we, we add here the the variables that are hypothesized to be relevant based on the drift diffusion model, okay, this fixation or the attentional drift diffusion model. What you see here, we don't add the relative valuation variables here and their interactions, but we add basically fixation towers the sure option. We add the interaction between the treatment condition and fixation towers the sure option, and the interaction between stake size and fixation towers the sure option. And what you see here is again a large increase, actually an even larger increase in conditional R squares. So adding fixation times uh, uh, gives you uh, a quite a strong increase in, in explanatory power in explaining the choice of the sure option. And in the final column, uh, we add all the variables basically, okay? And that means in particular, we add also the attentional discount parameters, uh, theta s and theta g, and their interactions with fixation time towards the sure option. And now when you look at these regressions, then the first noteworthy thing is this. So the first regression shows you the raw treatment effect without additional explanatory variables. So in the last condition, the choice advantage of the sure option is smaller and negative coefficient. If you add relative valuation variables, so the traditional hypothesis variables, uh, you reduce basically this, uh, this treatment effect because they explain part of the, they explain part of the treatment effect, uh, of the framing effect. Similar things occur when you add uh, these intentional variables, you reduce the treatment effect, but the really big effect occurs when you add the parameter changes that I induced by, by the framing effect, okay? So basically these are the, note what we, what we add here to the regression as an explanatory variable is the estimated mean values of the individual's thetas, okay? And what you see here is when we add them, we basically nullify the, the treatment dummy implying that we basically explain away the whole frame, the whole, the whole treatment effect is now explained by the other variables. So basically suggesting that we have really caught or captured the mechanisms that are underlying the treatment effect. And the important consideration here is really uh, that all these, that this addition of the changing attentional discount factors does basically the biggest job in explaining the treatment effect. And uh, by the way, all these, uh, all these signs of the coefficients, they are completely in line with what the ADDM would predict. I don't have time, I can explain that if you have more time later on in the discussion. But all these, for example, theta s, what is theta s? If theta s is the attentional discount for the sure option. Now if theta s increases, there's less attentional discounting for the sure option and less attentional discounting for the sure option should increase the choice probability of the sure option. And that's exactly what you observe. 
And, and, and the similar considerations hold for, for the other coefficients here, they're, they're fully in line with what the ADDM would predict. And with that, uh, I can summarize what we have found. Well, let me start by pointing out again that there is still limited understanding of framing effects occur. That is the underlying psychological mechanisms are not yet well understood. Process models, not just the model I considered here, offer in principle a rich menu of possible mechanisms. We examined the hypothesis that framing has a causal effect on attention and that this translates into changes in choices across frames. The ADADM is a natural candidate theory for examining this hypothesis and all major ADDM predictions are confirmed by the data. Attentional shifts in particular caused by frame changes seem to explain important parts of the framing effect. The impact of attentional shifts on behavioral framing effects is magnified by changes in the attentional discount parameters. And these changes in attentional discount parameters explain large parts of the behavioral framing effects. However, changes in valuation as hypothesized in prospect theory still also play an empirical role. And with that, I thank you for listening to my presentation and I'm looking forward to our discussion. And I think I can now stop sharing, I guess, uh, Antonio. Thank you so much for a very, very beautiful talk. And now we're gonna proceed to the second part of the event to will give us a chance to discuss these ideas in more detail. And given the size of the audience, I just want to repeat the rules for this part of the event for the fire chat. First, I will serve as a moderator Second, if you want to ask a question or participate in the discussion, please raise your hand using the feature in Zoom. And the moderator will unmute you and invite you to join the discussion when the time comes. Finally, I will do my best to moderate the discussion in a productive and uh, balanced way. But I ask you to be patient with us. It's the first time we run this and we are still fine tuning our procedures. Needless to say, any feedback about how to improve this let us know. We're eager to get it right. So with that said, uh, Colin, please. Um, that was beautiful. Uh, I have a simple question, which is what, what is the state of the art on the interpretation of the thetas? Because as you mentioned, and then you can see very clearly in the histograms, the, the theta Gs are, um, quite low and theta S is quite high and the model kind of falls apart if you don't, if you equate them. I, my guess is something like working memory and you can see why there might be a working memory difference in, in the kind of residue of sure versus the residue of gamble, which is more visually complex thoughts. Well, actually I, I have also thought about this and I also come more and more to the conviction that working memory could be a an underlying mechanism because, and working memory in the sense that if I attend an option, then that option is just is processed in my decision making, whereas the other option is not processed currently. So I have basically, in a sense, limited working memory. And, uh, and, uh, and that leads to a discounting, basically, it's basically, I mean, that's <laughs> more recently, I thought this, this, this could be a, a really a psychological reason behind the behind the thetas that we have limited working memory and it's it's not that we completely forget it but it has working memory in the sense that it doesn't fill it doesn't feed into the decision making process at that point in time and and actually when, when in our experiment when we increase attention towards particular options then uh, what we tell people is think about the pros and cons of that option uh, that that uh, then and they think about the pros and cons of that option. They don't think automatically about the pros and cons of the other option, and 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 that's the that could be the mechanism why why attention has this effect. Thank you, Ernst. Uh, uh, John. Oh, sorry, I need. Yeah. Hi. Yes, thank you, Ernst, for a lovely talk. Um, so I was just, I actually have two questions. One is kind of more of a technical one and the other is more of a kind of conceptual one. Let's ask them sequentially to facilitate the discussion, please. 
Okay, um, so the, the technical one is just about um, the parameters in the ADDM, because um, obviously there's lots of different parameters that can produce similar effects on behavior. And so one question I was wondering is to what extent are they all uniquely identifiable? Um, so, because of course you could see if there's correlations between parameters, you might see an effect both on the attentional uh, bias uh, parameters and on, for example, the risk uh, pre preference parameters. So I'm just wondering if that is an artifact of the fact that it just might be highly correlated or whether these are really uniquely identifiable. I think we, we did extensive Monte Carlo, we did extensive simulations where we used, uh, basically we, we, we knew the data generating process. We basically knew the, 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 the parameters we, we, uh, we chose for the data generating process. Then we recovered uh, the parameters and these recovery exercises, they typically show the very, very high reliant reliability. So we are pretty confident that we that we uh, that we have here um, identified the right parameters. Great. Okay. And then the second question I think is more about um, so attention here is kind of playing um, this causal role, right? And you're hypothesizing that the framing is kind of causally influencing the attention. Um, so one kind of I guess broad concern we could have with just kind of putting attention in this reified place is that it's kind of um, almost like a ghost in the machine in a way, you know, it's, it's um, you know, what is actually driving the attention in the first place. Um, and so, you know, it, it almost gives us a, and puts in a, us in an unsatisfying place because there could be all kinds of things that drive attention. Um, and so, you know, I just want to get your thoughts on that. And I guess another thought would be, you know, what is it about the framing that is changing attention in the way that is then driving the effect? Well, these are very deep questions and not easy to answer. Uh, so basically, I mean, what we did so far is uh, we do, if you can't explain the levels, you try to explain the changes. This is a typical way of moving forward in economics. Uh, so. So, I mean, there are many things that affect attention, as you, as you correctly point out. And we have, uh, we, I think we unambiguously show that framing does have a causal effect on attention. That's the nice thing here. Now, why it has this effect? I mean, that's like asking, why does uh, framing make people more risk averse in the last domain? <laughs> It's, 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 it's this, these deeper questions where we have no handle on that, basically. I mean, I think that's the next generation of researchers <laughs> that has to tackle that. So I'm pretty happy that I have been able to, to extend the, the mechanisms behind the framing effect by a plausible candidate mechanisms that show up nicely in the data and are confirmed by a, I mean, there's a rigorous model here. There are data here that confirm the prediction many predictions of the model. So the model had, had many chances to fail. Uh, and, uh, but, but what, why, why is it the case that framing changes, changes attention? Now, maybe we should start thinking along the lines of perhaps it, it is somehow interacts with our working memory, uh, with our working memory mechanisms. Uh, but I have no good answer to the question, honestly. Can I just want to throw one, one small uh, line in there, which I think these are very deep questions, as you said, but there is, there is an intermediate step before we have a full model of attention, which is it would be nice to know, for example, if whenever you move to this class of context or situations, attention, and by attention, I mean fixations, tend to switch in this particular way or where this particular variable. We still don't, that would still would not give you a full, answer to what is the ghost in the machine using just terminology but for the field it would be very nice to have a mapping of different contextual variables how do they to bias fixations and how does that filter through choice that kind of can be the next step without being able to answer um, the full question um, the next uh, question comes from Doug Lee let me unmute you Doug one second oh, go ahead Hi Ernst, thanks for the talk. So my my question was initially very much in line with Colin. So I guess I'll just add a quick follow up question. 
Um, so this idea of the different um, theta parameters for the gamble versus the loss, uh, sure option. Um, what to me, like Colin perhaps alluded to, it's possibly due to the fact that the gamble involves uh, a combination of probability plus magnitude, whereas a sure option is maybe a smaller dimension, just the magnitude, so that's less likely to decay. Um, but have you have you thought about ways to to explore this further and maybe verify that it is based on the complexity of the, the memory? We have not yet done, but I, I think that's a really interesting idea that uh, basically the hypothesis would be the more complex an option is, uh, the more it is likely to be intentionally disadvantaged if it's not attended because it just but it, it re relates to the working memory interpretation because the more complex the object is the more the, the constraints on working memory become binding and and that could explain why we see stronger attentional discounts uh, uh, for the for the more complex option well actually that's not true i mean when i when i just think back uh, to the distributions i have shown you then uh, well, it is the, it is true. I think the, the theta gamble is typically smaller than the theta for the sure option. So we should check that. Is theta gamble smaller than theta sure? Because that would uh, speak to that question. So I don't, I mean, according to my memory, it may be in going that direction, may not be significant, but it's an interesting hypothesis. Okay, thanks. Um, the sorry, Ryan Webb. Hi, Ernst. Uh, I just had a technical question about how how you are estimating the model, um, and in particular with, with the table um, at the very end um, when you're running the logistic regression. Um, so the, the first question, I guess, is were the response times of the subjects included in the model um, when you were estimating it, or were you estimating like a a full structural model when you were estimating the um, accumulation process, like say simulating it and then estimating it that way. So was it was it a logistic regression when you were putting the response times in, or was it like a full? Well, in the I mean, we have to distinguish between the logistic regression and the the, the estimation of the parameters. And for the for the estimation of the parameters, as far as I remember, we have, of course, considered the, re the response times. I mean, usually- But not in the second, not in the last table, which-, which Not in the last table, because they are basically, if you like, they are incorporated in the, in the they are already incorporated in the, in the parameters estimate. So we okay. would have used them twice, kind of, yeah. Ryan, is there a concern that you have on the back of your head about how the estimation may affect some of the results? Well, um, yes, because I mean, the response times are endogenous here, right? So if they're an endogenous variable and you're putting them into the logistic regression, then you have the problems of putting an endogenous variable into it. No, we since did the eye the movements are- Logistic regression, they were not included. Right, and since the mm -hmm. eye movements are, we think, at least in the, from the data, exogenous in the sense, then you can put the fixation times and the dwell times into the regression and it's fine. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, there's uh, a uh, Eric, Eric Johnson, welcome. Thank you. G great talk, Ernst. I, you teased about this attentional manipulation. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that, particularly since when you said you asked people to think about you know, the gamble or the sure things advantages. That sounds more like you're asking them to retrieve from memory. So I'm wondering if you're, one way of thinking about this is that attention is being driven by retrieval as opposed to the other way around. So I wanna know about the result and I'm curious what you think of the thought. So let me share the screen then again, because I, I can then show you what I have in my slides. Uh, uh, just uh, while, while Ernst does that, an advertisement for something that if you're interested in working in this area, if you're a young person, you probably want to read, which is uh, Eric has worked for, for many years on something called query theory, um, which will provide some ideas about the mechanisms under which the memory may be playing a role here. 
Okay, so thank you. Me, so I'm I'm struggling with. Uh, um, it's, I, I need to go here. So. So this is the these are the slides. So you can can you see them? Yes. Yeah. So so the question. So what we did here is the following. Uh, so we asked the question: Do changes in attention cause changes in behavior? And what we did is we in in our attention manipulation experiment, we increase attention towards the gamble in the gain condition, and that should reduce the choice advantage of the sure option in that condition because we increase attention towards the gamble. Okay, so it re should reduce the framing effect. We also increase the tension towards the sure option in the loss condition, which should increase choices towards the sure option in that condition, which also goes. So basically, that these two effects combined should reduce attention. The attention manipulation should reduce the framing effect. Now, did we shift the tension? I show you in a minute how we how we manipulated the tension. Did we shift the tension? Well, you see here the proportion of fixations to the sure option. And what you see here, the blue graph tells you the fixations that go to the sure option without manipulation and the fixation minus the fixations that go to the sure option when we shift the tension towards the gamble, okay? And we see an excess, so to speak, attention here uh, for the sure option uh, as predicted. So we successfully in other words, we this is kind of a manipulation check. Yes, we successfully shifted the tension, okay, uh, here in the gain condition, and the same for the loss condition. Because if we shift in the this condition here, the loss where we shift the tension towards the sure option, uh, that means the probability uh, the right hand variable should be larger than the left hand variable here. And that should be a negative term. The, so, and that's what the case, what's the case. So basically we shifted the tension by five percentage points in the direction of the sure option by, by, by the manipulating uh, attention towards the gamble in the gain condition. And we shifted it roughly by 5% in the other direction by manipulating attention in the direction of the sure option in the loss condition. So what are the behavioral effects that we observe? Well, they are basically, they are correlated. Well, that's exactly what the drift diffusion model would predict. So we basically, in, we, we increase this, this, the probability of choosing the sure option when we uh, do this. And here we decrease the probability of the, choosing the sure option. Now, uh, overall, this is the overall effect then so when this is the framing effect, basically, this is the behavioral framing effect, probability of choosing the sure option again, minus probability of choosing the sure option in the last condition. And you see that framing effect is 10 percentage points uh, between 10 and 20 as a function of stake size. And we have it basically, it's even more than we get it down to all less than 5% basically sometimes. Uh, so in natural condition. So this just repeating, showing you that we successfully did many reduce the framing effect. Now, how did we manipulate the tension? Well, we did this the following way. Subjects could in this experiment, in this attention shifting experiment, subjects could only see the options sequentially, either the option on the left or on the right, but they could freely choose whether they want to see the option on the left or the right. So subjects decide which option they want to see, but they see one option and not this, uh, simultaneously the other, which is basically kind of uh, creating a working memory constraint, if you like. Yeah, that's true. So if I look at one option, I don't see the other one. So it's basically aggravating the working memory constraint, if you like. And in the instructions for the experiment, we told them you are asked to look at and carefully think about the pros and cons of the option highlighted with a gray frame. So we circled that with a gray frame. So we, we, we deliberately caused, caused, said, think about the pros and, and cons, and cons, so there could be arguments against it, so that we stay neutral at that level. But the ultimate effect here is that 
uh, they 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 pay more attention to this uh, uh, to this option and they choose it more frequently. So that's what what we did here. Uh, Eric. I want to ask you a follow up question on this. Um, we have a struggle in in the lab over the years, not with creating causal effects of attention, but with creating causal effects of attention by manipulating attention exogenously that are as strong, as high in magnitude as the model predicts, as the ADDM predicts. So you could imagine you take, you feed the model with the parameters and then you can ask if I see a 10% of increase in attention that should feed that there should be this much of an increase in choice, et cetera. You can make quantitative predictions. Yes. And we have a struggle, it took many years to be able to match them. The question is, do you know if in your data, you can actually, your causal experiments, the magnitudes of the effects are consistent with the predictions of your feeded ADDMs at the group level, let's say on average, given the attentional effects that you see. I think we did something like that, but I would have to rely now on Todd's and Gaia's knowledge whether we explicitly tested that. So I, I, I am, I am, it's too much, I, I don't know the answer to this question. The, but the only reason I'm pushing you again, this is for the purpose of discussion in the field, is that no, no, I think that's, great, a, that's a test right. that the models need to pass to keep all of us honest of yeah. how much we can explain and what is missing. In some sense, it's, it's a nice way to push ourselves on. Yeah. I, I completely agree. So in the, I mean, this is the advantage of having structural models that you can get at the quantities. So at the, at, at the current level of our analysis, we are very happy that we, we get all the qualitative predictions right. <laughs> now let's, let's move in the next step to the quantitative predictions. Thank yeah. you, Eric. Let me move to the next uh, person who wants to participate. Ian Krakvich, could you please uh, unmute? Sorry, Ian, I'm struggling here with the controls. Hi, Ernst. Uh, thanks for the great talk. So um, I have two, two things. One is a, one's a comment and then one sort of a comment question. So one comment is actually following up on, on Doug, Doug Lee's um, question. Uh, so we actually have a, with Steph Smith and Steven Spiller, we have an experiment on opportunity cost neglect where subjects are buying products and they can either, uh, the, the don't buy option is either framed as don't buy or uh, keep the money. And we estimate separate thetas like in your model and we get different thetas, different discount factors on the don't buy option, depending on the framing. So I think that speaks a bit to, to the question of the complexity. So there, the, the comp there's no difference in complexity in the, in the stimuli. It's in the, it's this complexity of the representation, right? It's, it's how you represent either what else you could do with the money versus um, uh, just like not buying this product. So I, I, Maybe that sheds some light on um, on that issue. Is that published? The, 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 sorry. Is that paper published? No. So it's 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 in review. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, but we but we also get definitely very different thetas um, for buy and don't buy, and again, it also is a function of the the framing. So uh, very convergent uh, results there. Uh, the, the second, the, the, the question slash comment is, uh, you're probably aware of this, um, this work by Michael Frank, uh, arguing that there's also this sort of this additive component in the, in, in the ADDM. Um, and, you know, this is, he had this recent science paper arguing that, uh, you know, attention is being sort of drawn to the, to the chosen option, especially as the, as the choice progresses. And, you know, one, one, one thing I'm wondering is, is did you look for additive, these sort of additive effects in your, in your study? And, and, and a comment is, you know, one thing that goes, that, that works against that argument and works against this sort of reverse causality is, is when you, earlier in your talk, you showed, um, you see it within the game, within the game framing, you showed, you split the data into trials where the gamble was looked at more or the sure option was looked at more. And even in the case where the gamble was looked at more, people were choosing the sure option more often than not. So I think that, you know, that data, that result right there uh, does argue against this, this idea that attention is just being drawn to the, to the chosen option. 
Well, uh, I, I should add here, I mean, one feature of our experiment, uh, of the main experiment is that the expected value of the gamble was always equal to the monetary amount of the sure option. And that introduces naturally uh, more risk averse choices. Because if, if there are, people are a little bit risk averse, then risk neutral people, they should be indifferent here. But if they are a little bit risk averse, and we know that people are risk averse at small stakes, then we, should, we generally should observe a higher frequency of choosing the sure option, even in the loss condition. Uh, so that is kind of, there are so, there's, there are so many factors, according to the model, affecting, so to speak, all overall behaviors, that it's not easy to make an inference from that alone. Uh, the fact that that we see uh, uh, more risk, of, even more risk of choices in the in the in the last condition, but maybe I understood your question not the right way, so I'm not sure. Well, I guess m my point was, even even if that's the case, if 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 the if the real explanation is that people are attending to the option that they're about to choose, you would expect that in those in those trials where people are going to choose. The gamble; those would be the trials where they're looking at the gamble, and 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 so and I think your results show that that's at least that's that's not the case. That when people are looking more at the gamble, they're still choosing the sure option more often than yes, not. yes, yes, so. yes. That's true. That's true. But that could be due to the valuation. Yeah, that's it could. It, it, of course, it could be. Um, and, and I think that that makes a lot of, in the ADDM that makes total sense. What's affecting the choice is the valuation plus attention. But in this alternative you know, model that, that, again, that Frank and, and, and Michael Frank and others have proposed is that the, you know, the, the choice is drawing the attention. So, um, so you would expect a tight link between the attention and choice. Uh, yeah, but then, the but then we should see that relative, I mean, okay, yeah, okay. No, we, I haven't tested explicitly, but we should. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Let me ask, uh, the, I, I will move to another couple of questions in a second, but I want to throw a big question to Ernst and to some of the other uh, behavioral economists in the call who have thought a lot about these things. Um, and if someone else besides Ernst wants to respond to this, just raise your hand and I will unmute you. But question, there is a larger theme here besides framing effects, which is there is a, this list of canonical behavioral economic effects or biases. And how many of them can be at least partially explained for by attentional effects, by the fact that the contextual manipulation is changing attention? If you, you have any thought of other areas where this type of work? I mean, a promising research project for a young, young scholar in the call. Well, we, uh, Gaia and Todd and, and I have uh, another project on the decoy effect where we show, have very convincing data that the decoy effect may well also be driven by attentional effects. So we have very convincing data. And so we have, we have two candidates here, decoy and, and framing, but I, I think it would be great to, to have a list of uh, behavioral effects where attention could be an interesting candidate explanation. So because the whole research program that uh, at least I am interested in is to provide a unifying account of, of this diversity of behavioral effects. And I don't think attention is all that we have. And actually attention as we have seen in the discussion seems to be sometimes the other side of working memory constraints, because if my working memory is limited, then I'm automatically also limited in my attention. Uh, but uh, let's say imperfect perception is, is another good, imperfect attention, imperfect att at perception, imperfect memory. These three things are, I think, I mean, Andre Schleifer calls it behavioral economics 2.0 or 3.0. <laughs> <laughs> to go at that level uh, to, to provide unifying explanations of behavioral anomalies. And I think that's a great research program. And I think people should, should really go in that direction. I think there's great promise here. 
Okay, uh, next question comes from Abdelaziz Al Shawari. Hello, thank you so much for the talk. It's, um, it, it's, it was really good. I just have a question about the design. Um, I was wondering why you were um, not showing particular numbers and just showing the pies and the uh, rectangles instead of the numbers. Uh, that's a good question. So we 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 took we made a conservative choice here by by not showing the numbers, but uh, by by symbolically representing basically this with these uh, rectangles and pies. We thought that they have to look at that. <laughs> so there's a minimal amount, there's a minimal level of attention going. And it's also, let's say, if you, if you measure attention, it's also easier to, to see, I mean, do they, when you do the eye tracking, you see what, do they cover the area that you show them or are they outside the area? Uh, and, uh, but I think the intuitive reason was inducing a minimal level of looking that can be manipulated and that can be shifted around. Let, and, me, uh, let me say one thing about this and I'm also asking Ian if he wants to, co to comment on this. For those of you who are thinking of experiments of this type, which is in my experience, if you show a number, you're going to get fixations that tend to be very short on the order of 200, 250 milliseconds. And the variance across trials and participants is very small. Whereas if you show a pie like Ernst has, you're going to get longer fixations and there's going to be more variance. In which experiments like this, you want to explore, exploit the variance a lot, is really, really helpful. So that's, a, in my view, is a very key part of the design. Is, is there anything you want to add to that, Ian? That may be useful. Yeah, we've also avoided we, yeah, we've also avoided using num numbers for partly for that reason, partly also to sort of prevent sort of automatic calculation types of um, you know responses. Uh, the the flip side is that when you're using these kinds of displays, you know, pies that are more filled in could be could be brighter, therefore more salient, therefore attract attention. So, you know, th that that could be a good thing because it, it provides some exogenous manipulation of attention, but you just need to be aware of it. Ernst, you want to say something else about this? No, I mean, I have said what I meant to say. It's basically, I mean, basically what you tell me is that we, we did intuitively the right thing. It was just instinct to say you have a minimal level of looking time that you that there is something to shift around. If, if there's nothing to shift around, then by the frames, OK, for example, then we have no effect, OK? so. It's, it was, and, and it seems to be, have been a good decision in the end. We have time for two, one or two more questions, depending on the length. Um, the next person is Benjamin, Benjamin Midler. Um, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering whether uh, you've considered combining these sorts of attentional control or uh, manipulation mechanisms with some kind of fMRI experiment uh, in order to, to elucidate the uh, neural impacts of attention on these uh, neuroeconomic decisions, specifically like how attention manifests in specific regions such as the nucleus accumbens and interior insula, and whether you've given any thought to uh, whether that would provide insight into like what part of this risky decision is being impacted by attention, for instance, if um, like outcomes are being emphasized or if risk is being de-emphasized. I think this is a great, great research uh, idea. So to combine the, the attention manipulation experiments and we know now that framing is an attention manipulation experiment. So, I mean, I don't know whether in De Martino et al actually they had uh, eye tracking, um, but if they had eye tracking data in principle, uh, one could uh, apply our modeling approach and, and reanalyze these data. I don't think uh, they did. They didn't? I don't think so. You don't think so. But then somebody else could do it and, and could get a deeper understanding uh, of the underlying mechanisms. I, I mean, in particular, for example, if you, there was the question that we have no, where we have no good answer. Why does change, why do changing frames trigger 
changes in attention. So maybe uh, brain data can help us here. I had, this is just speculation, but uh, uh, maybe they can. And that would be basically going down the next level of layer of, uh, of, uh, of, of what we don't know uh, uh, in order to understand uh, the issues involved better. Um, Sharon Chen. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk, Ernst. Um, I'll just ask one of my questions. Uh, so what would be the next steps um, if the ADDM predictions were not observed? Um, yeah. Well, um, I think the, I, I mean, I do, uh, my, my my approach to models is that they are a workhorse for generating hypotheses, and if a model fails, that's not wrong. Then we learn something that there must be some other mechanisms at work. And now um, the the I have the feeling that the, the ADDM did exceptionally well here, which does not mean that it is always doing well like that. Uh, and so my, my actually, we, we tried to submit this paper to an economics journal to get the economists to listen uh, to, to, to the neuroeconomic research here, because we, we are helping solving a problem that ha also have bothered them for decades. Uh, now, uh, but I, let's say if we, if, I think this is the advantage of also structural models. So you know, that when you do the exercise that, uh, that Antonio suggested that does the change in attention that we see in our data in the attention manipulation experiment lead to effects that are quantitatively at the level that would be predicted by the model. Uh, that gives you a very sharp test of the model and the model then it's, it's, it's much harder for the model to meet that test. And it, it tells you something about the limits of the model and therefore you learn something. That doesn't, that helps you to, let's say, construct alternatives model, but what they are, I can't tell you at this moment. But I think the whole research program is important that you do rigorous, uh, uh, not just comparative static predictions, like something is bigger than zero or smaller than zero, but you do also level predictions because they are much harder to, I mean, in very, very often, the ne when we criticize the neoclassical model, the important thing is that they didn't just fail in some instances uh, in, uh, in let's say the sign of an effect, they, they failed totally in some instances with regard to the levels. You know, we should see no rejections in the ultimatum game, zero. Okay, and we see huge numbers of rejections in the ultimatum game, for example. Thank you so much, Ernst. Um, we come to the end of the event. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone two weeks from now for a talk by Daphna Shahami from Colombia, who will speak on how memory guides value-based decision-making. And thank you, thank you so much, Ernst, for a beautiful talk. Everybody, have a good day, wherever you are. Thanks a lot. Bye.